Hello and welcome to True Stuff Myself. I'm Anastasia and I am again joined with my dear friend Lily Brunson, who is an incredible research and writer and our beloved little pickle. And the mascot. the mascot of our, our show. Yeah. So today we're going to be um, having a little bit of a story time and going into the archetypes of beauty and the beast and continuing on some of the work that we're doing in previous episodes so thank yeah. you again for spending your Sunday with me it's a real honor to have you here yeah. and to be able to share always a with you. pleasure so. no it's always a pleasure Anastasia it's lovely to see you and I'm glad to see you still smiling <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while I know but we've all we've, we've all had stuff to deal with haven't we we have we have we have yeah. had, both had our stuff to deal with but as promised we wanted to dive a little bit deeper into some of this Rick shed a little bit of light on some of this darkness that we're experiencing at the moment mm. so can you go ahead and just explain to the viewers the mm. beauty and the beast archetype that is, um, you know, in our stories? And I think what's really important is everything is a story, you know, our, yes. all the stories are all around us. And, and this is a, a very interesting tale, should we say? Well, it is, especially in, in regard to current events and the fact that everything at the moment seems topsy turvy. Everything that's black seems white and everything that's white seems black. We have no central ground that we can stand on. We're in quicksand in the media, the mainstream media, everywhere. We're bombarded by information that could be true and could be silent. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like to look at today, if I may, is to talk about the beauty and the beast as a kind of metaphor for the archetype of bestiality mm -hmm. as opposed to the archetype of beauty which is really about purity and innocence and love and so quick recap of the story i think perhaps yeah which innocence seems to be um just being stripped out of our society yes. and, and the innocent are being condemned as well which is really sad really sad it is, so, it is. Mm. There's, a, there's there's so much injustice mm. that it going on right now across the planet not just in the western world but all over mm. and the corruption of innocence and the um, the inversion of love to hate appears to be very much part of that so briefly um the story itself was written by a lady in 1740 her name was gabrielle suzanne barbeau de Villeneuve, and she was um obviously she wrote the story but it was very much based on previous cycles of stories which involved a kind of an older story which may actually date back to the second century AD um, which was called The Golden Ass and that was written um, by ch a chap called Lucius Madurensis, somebody I've never heard of mm -hmm. but forgive my ignorance um, but the University of Durham in Lisbon found similar stories that are over 4,000 years old. Wow, so very deep-rooted, uh, yeah. very deep-rooted. Very, very. So basically, the, uh, I shall tell the story. Um, so I hope we're all sitting comfy and <laughs> cups of tea. It won't take long because in, in a nutshell, this is a very simple story. But there are so many different versions. And obviously Disney and other filmmakers like Jean Cocteau have, have done versions of Beauty and the Beast in the past. But ultimately, it involves um, a beautiful girl called Belle who lives with her father. In some versions, she has brothers and sisters in the traditional versions that we have grown accustomed to. Um, she simply um, is an only child, seemingly, which would be unusual in a French village back then. Mm -hmm. However, um, Belle's father goes out to try and either salvage his ships in one story or make some money in another. and asks Belle what she would like him to bring her back and she says just a single rose, the rose of purity and so mm. forth and love too mm. and he leaves and goes and gets caught in a fearsome storm and during that storm he winds up at the castle, an enchanted castle actually, of a beast and the beast fights him and um, imprisons him and the father then makes a bargain with the beast that he will bring his daughter to the castle and if she of her own free will 
will agree to stay at the castle. They can trade places. So there's your contract, and there's the um, the kind of the motivation. And of course, he goes back to the village, talks to Belle. Belle says, "Yep, no problem. I'll trade my place for yours." And that's exactly what happens. The beast has actually been enchanted previously by a sorceress. The stories around that are actually very interesting mm. in different versions. Um, but in a nutshell, he's transformed from a handsome, arrogant, somewhat narcissistic, selfish prince into a beast, which clearly mirrors those traits on the outside. Yeah. And the yeah. only way that the curse of that can be broken is if um, he falls in love with and she falls in love with him as he is, as, an, as a beast. And so Belle stays in relative luxury in the castle and um, gradually falls in love with the beast mm. for his character and his kindness. And at a certain point, they hear news from the village that her father is unwell. In some stories, she the father's gone mad. And she returns to her father briefly with the permission of the beast to do so. And um, she goes to her father and gives him succor. She, in some stories, she has a magic mirror in which she can see that the beast is pining away for her and in fact dying. So she returns to the castle, declares her love for the, um, the beast, and the beast transforms instantly into a handsome prince. They marry and the enchantment is lifted. And obviously the Disney movie had all these characters who were furniture, who were really mm. the servants and so forth. <laughs> So there are many versions of it, but the nutshell version is that the, the beautiful purity of Belle, the mm -hmm. selfishness of Belle, transforms the selfish, arrogant, wounded inner masculine of the beast. And through the alchemy of conjoining, mm -hmm. um, the inner masculine and the inner feminine are married in happy alchemical wedding style. Mm -hmm. And that's the basis of the story. However, there's lots of elements to the story that are actually based on fact, which again is another fascinating aspect to some of the fairy tales that many people aren't aware of. But um, there was a bit of a thing in ancient Parson, maybe 300 years ago, 1800s roughly, when animal grooms and bestial brides were often wedded. Oh. Uh-huh. <laughs> and... In some respects, many some commenters commentators have said that the um, the Beauty and the Beast tale written by Villeneuve, the, the lady in the seventeen forty, um, was actually a way of encouraging girls into arranged marriages, which were incredibly common at the time. Okay, it's kind of like a, a way of preparing them. So early predictive programming. Precisely, yeah, and that, that is exactly what we're looking at in some mm -hmm. senses, according to those commentators, and of course. Um, that I then found that the basis of the story is actually rooted in, in an actual person. And th there was a beast who was born in Tenerife in the in Canary Islands in, in 1537. And his name was Petrus Gonsalves. And he was known as the Man of the Woods, which is an interesting wow. way of, of, of describing him. Um, and he had something called hypertrichosis, which is excessive hairiness. Mm, and there are pictures, which I'm sure you'll be able to link. Um, yeah, to I will do. Of him, showing that he, he literally is covered in hair. Um, his mm. face, facial hair is more than just a beard. It's literally complete. Um, and he actually married a very beautiful lady from the, Spanish, uh, from the French court called Catherine. In some, um, in some versions, she was Dutch, but I, I think she was probably French because he spent a lot of time in the court of Henry, v, um, Henry II, the French king. Um, they had seven children, four of whom had exactly the same affliction as the father. Oh, wow. Interesting. Not Very unknown, interesting. isn't it? Mm. Isn't it? Mm. And those beasts, um, in inverted commas, um, may even be part of the beasts of the woods that people are documenting at the moment within the UFO and, and the paranormal um, communities who are talking about the two-legged dog-like creatures who seem human and yet are covered in black hair usually. 
very often they have sore sore eyes but there have been many reports of things like this Oh, it's like mm. um, the grim fairy tales, isn't it? It's like very much. Uh, I don't yeah. know if you watched the series on Netflix, but it's no. it, yeah. There's a really good series called the. It's just called Grim, yeah. and yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a bit like that. Mm, interesting. So they, they, do they have a a, a werewolf? Type oh, they have life? they have all the different uh, fairy tale characters mm. um, throughout the series, and it's interesting. Uh, uh, but they're human at first, and then they transform into these um, into these archetypes Beasts. that you talk about. Yeah. So it's interesting. Well, again, I mean, that's just that, literally with you saying that, it's just reminded me of the vampire thing where they're pretty normal people, mm. usually in story cycles, TV series, and film, um, that transform at night into something bestial and, mm-hmm. and blood sucking. Mm. And it, in a similar way, I mean, you know, on an inner level, the story of Belle and her beast is very much about coming to terms with loving and um, taming the bestial qualities within the human yeah and taming them to 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 a degree that one man can be in harmony with the shadow self yeah, yeah. and i do see the the beast very much as a potential shadow self yeah i would agree and again with that. Mm, and I, th- yeah. I think i think the story exemplifies that with the alchemical marriage at the end because yeah. you know the, the the transformation that occurs is 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 not one where bell transforms transforms in any way she's perfect pretty much from the get-go mm. you know she's an independent-minded bookish mm-hmm. girl knows what she wants she doesn't want the usual life of a villager mm-hmm. um, she seems to be pretty emotionally sound in mm. that she um she certainly loves her father and she her selflessness is is very beautiful to watch and so she has all of those qualities already, I think, in sacred feminine terms. Mm-hmm. She, she already has that. So her beauty and grace, in a way, being shone in the situation with the beast, yeah, definitely assist him in his great transformative arc through the story. And it shows the, the shows the power of the light as well, doesn't it? Just how powerful the light is. Yeah, and yeah. love. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah love. Yeah. And ultimately, it's mm. that purity of love because, mm. you know, I mean, you, you've got to imagine that, that beast guy, he's not terribly sexually attractive, you know? No, can't and imagine both, he is. No, so <laughs> she's, she has fallen in love with the soul of the creature yeah. as opposed to the out, outside packaging, mm. how he looks. And so as a result of that, there is, that, the, the, there is a purity of vision within her that sees mm. beyond the exterior into the heart. And that, that is quite lovely. And of course, he wants to live up to that. So his story arc literally is one of complete transformation from a narcissistic, selfish mm. guy mm-hmm. into... There's a funny noise on the line there. Yeah, that? there is a funny noise, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to <laughs> ignore it a little bit, but there is a Fair funny enough. noise. Fair noise. I wondered what that was. No, right. there is a funny noise. But you know what it reminds me of? It reminds yes. me of just, just, I was just thinking of my own work with parts work. It's, it's that Belle is very much in self energy, you know, she's coming mm. from that purity. And when yes, somebody is. is in self energy, you can see beyond their parts, beyond, beyond their yes. darkness, and you can, and you can embrace that and, and bring that yeah. forward. So. And I think that 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 story that that part of the story of the inner magic mm. of bringing that whole aligned authentic self mm-hmm. that's loving and kind and compassionate to a situation which is after all I mean you know it does involve a little bit of Stockholm syndrome potentially mm-hmm. yeah it you does know, there's, there's a whiff of there's a, there's a whiff of that because he's you, a jailer he's you trusted. could say it's just trauma bonded perhaps. <laughs> You, you very easily could because there is definitely a sniff of that in, mm-hmm. in, in that particular scenario. I don't think there is because of the fact that the guy himself transforms, not her. Yeah, she's, yes, yeah. she stays the same in that quarter, yeah. which is why I referenced that earlier because she's staying within her authentic vibe and he is definitely the one that does all the transforming. He, he steps, if you like, from the darkness of selfish narcissistic. Mm-hmm. Um, behavior and a, an entitled prince which is what he once was into a caring compassionate and um, loving partner mm-hmm. so overall we have basically a rather lovely story in some senses that good will always triumph over the the, the hardships yes um, it always and the, will and the appearance of mm-hmm. evil mm-hmm. and you know, I think that's a lovely thing for the poor little French girls who were busy being married off to counts and 
barrenness throughout France in arranged marriages, you know, and I can see how that would be predictably programming them to accept it. Mm. <laughs> Sadly, but it's the, it's the case. So moving from our archetype of this bestial corruption of purity, we come into the more modern times when we're looking at um, people who have influenced us maybe from a very negative standpoint and perhaps gone down routes that neither you nor I or probably our viewers too, so apologies, Jeff, mm. would like to tread. But we need to look at the main beasts who have been influencing our thought and our um, gestalt as humans for quite some time in the 20th and the 21st century. And mind control is big. Yes. Yeah, so yes. we're looking. So I just want to say, especially with um, social media now, uh, I mean, if you're uh, familiar with Cambridge Analytica and how they have, you know, they have 5,000 data set points on you at any one time. So we are yeah. very easy to manipulate now. So this yes. is why, and there's people out there in all walks of reality and all walks of life that study this stuff and know how mm. to use this manipulation on us. I'm getting some very then, interesting noises in my ear as I'm saying this. <laughs> it's not me, I promise you. The just pick, pickle maybe. I'll have the voice of God in my head in a minute. If I have the voice of God in my head in a minute, you know something's happening. Well, who killed Kennedy? <laughs> oh, God. Ask him, ask him but they, quick. But they, have, they have that, the CIA have the technology to infiltrate our thoughts and, you know, and, and, and we, get, we upload all our thoughts and all our consciousness to the AI cloud, which is now mimicking human consciousness as we know so yes and doing a very good job at actually impersonating yeah. people yeah, no question of, no question of that mm -hmm. but you know it's, um circo is the company that's behind um cambridge analytica and in fact cambridge analytica went uh, is now part of circo oh, company, I, didn't no know one, that. I didn't know that the company no one's ever heard of and they are actually one of the most evil corporations on the planet given what they're doing with links to the apps don't they do the um te telephones and things like that am i right i'm thinking of the right company i think i know everything with, uh, yeah with with regard to data management and data and communication travel, and communication is massively through circo the chap yeah. who's done the most work on on actually analyzing what circo has done is um david hawkins who works on with jason goodman on crowdsource the truth they do CSI crime scene investigation mm -hmm. um, and they, they literally go into um, a great deal of why Serco were actually behind and likely orchestrating 9-11. Oh wow! Mm. Oh, mm. I'll link that. I'll link that information in the comments because that's very interesting. Well, I did, I, I've not come across that information before. Well, so David Hawkins has come up with some extremely. I mean, we didn't even really want to go in this direction, but it is relevant because they. Um, he's at, he's come up with a very compelling theory, indeed, about how and why nine eleven was orchestrated by the guilds of different companies, the worshipful companies of variety communications teachers um, crime um, protectors and so forth all coming together orchestrated he thinks through bribery corruption and he links it very directly back to Epstein Maxwell and the whole sordid wow. gang and the yeah. whole 9-11 thing just basically allowed for every single free thinker to be mapped around the world so they know where yeah. we all are don't they because we're all yeah. talking about it so yes. they know where we are but, no for sure and you know bring it on but um <laughs> yeah. yeah you know it's like fine yeah. um he actually links it very and and one of the things that he says about it is that it was an incredibly scripted event mm. and i found that very compelling because they controlled the narrative very clearly in, in a way that I think is quite probably orchestrating many compartments because clearly some compartments didn't know that other ones existed, mm -hmm. very much like mm -hmm. the modern CIA and espionage as it's currently practiced. But what I found very interesting was his idea that everything was scripted very, very finely, even to the fact that he said that, you know, a goat herder in a cave in Afghanistan could not, under any circumstances, have orchestrated the events around 9-11. No. And he means he means a summer, didn't he? Yeah. 
Yeah. It's obvious, I know. Yeah. But it isn't. But it wasn't at the time. We mm. all thought, oh, okay, it must be a new enemy that we didn't know about. And here he is. It's called Osama Bin Laden. He, he actually sort of thinks that he's even a made-up character, quite possibly an algorithm. Oh, wow. Oh, interesting. Mm. interesting. And What's interesting now, Lois, I feel with where we are going now is I feel in somewhat we are able to control the narrative a little bit more now. Mm. I think we're, I we're, we're moving I into that space and that time where, hey, we're actually going to control the narrative and the timeline moving forward. And by listening and to supporting things like the work that you're doing around this, this is how we're going to change that narrative. It, it is actually, even though we are up against a massive monolithic conspiracy that defies mm. even my ability to um, conceive it. Um, there are aspects to this where you insert a different narrative into the program, a glitch in the matrix, if you yes. like to use that, that particular kind of analogy. Mm -hmm. But and interestingly, when you start talking about narratives, you start realizing that everything's a narrative. Yeah, everything's everything. a story. Everything is. Mm. I've, I've been realizing that recently, that everything yeah. is a story, yeah. Everything we see in this mm. shit circus that yeah. we see every day yeah. in the media is yeah. definitely a, a kind of scripted narrative. Mm -hmm. But so are the things that we play in our heads, the, the stories of where we come from and where we're going and who we love and who we hate and who mm -hmm. we want to go for dinner with and who we would rather spit upon are all things that are narratives that our minds and our hearts are guiding. Mm -hmm. And yes, absolutely, I think we are getting to a point where if, if there are enough of us creating a narrative that is what we want to envisage, what we want to bring in, which is fairness and justice and mm -hmm. sovereignty and love and peace and, and you know, kissing babies and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, if we can bring that narrative into um just reality through thinking it mm -hmm. never mind talking about it writing about it getting others involved in the dialogue um i think yes there is a chance for, for, for humanity to change the current direction mm -hmm. of this inversion perversion um this black and white agenda that we seem to be constantly faced with which seems to me and we're back again to can to um circo it seems to be that they have written scripts that we are all witnessing and many of them could be psyops. Many of them could be, and quite likely are, untrue. Mm. They may not even be real, and the characters in them may not even be real. And that gets us into this huge idea of just what the hell it is with it anymore. Mm. But I'd like to just talk about some of the beasts. Yes, please do. Characters. Let's bring some. Let's bring some light and awareness to some of these beasts. And yeah. Because they do, soon. because even though we've just diverted into a little side room, the sidebar, mm -hmm. it is an interesting sidebar because it feeds into what we're about to talk about. Because we're going to be talking about Anton LaVey and we're going to be looking at, yeah, AC comes in again, Mr. Alistair Crowley. And, yeah, and we're also <laughs> going to be talking about Michael Aquino. And we're going to be talking about them in a way that may surprise some people because not all of what we have to say is entirely negative. Don't I mean, don't. these these people are extremely clever. I've been realising this in my own life with, with various, you know, uh, manipulation and, and hats off to these people because they're so clever. They're they're clever. So clever. So clever. Well, I, I actually was doing some research into Aquino many years ago. Mm -hmm. this, this particular little phrase that he used at the time made me think very carefully about the way that the world is set up and the way that information is both broadcast to us and received by us. Mm -hmm. He said, 5% of our brain deals with logical cognitive reasoning and 95% of the brain is entirely subconscious absorbing everything it sees and knows. Yeah. He knew that. Yeah. Michael Aquino. Yeah, right? this is why I'm always telling people to do the subconscious work because this is a mental Absolutely. subconscious realm and reality. It really is. And, you know, I mean, again, we could perhaps cite that um, we see but a fraction of the electromagnetic mm. spectrum. Exactly. And we are aware yeah. of sound only to a very limited degree. And because of that, 
there is this subconscious mind which is vast and unmapped even now we're in 2019 and Mm. we are still in the dark about what the subconscious is capable of Mm. i think they've managed to map 15 percent of what the brain does and that's it Mm. you know when you think about what about the rest of it yeah when you think about how far technology has come as well and we're not even aware of the technology inside of us no and the technology inside of us is far vaster, quite, quite exactly, literally. Exactly, exactly. These quantum supercomputers that people are constantly <laughs> talking about, we've got one, mate. It's here. I know. And I know. here <laughs> and in the gut. Yeah. We have three brains, the, yeah. the mind, the heart, and the gut. And the vagus nerve combines all three. And mm-hmm. so we have got an, an, a superior form of tech within us. But there are vested interests in people not wanting us to know this, find out, and exercise the power that is our god-given right mm. if indeed god even exists and whew, that's a big question yeah but yeah getting but back people, to but people just need to remember we are powerful beings we are not mm. disempowered we are not no. you know controlled by everything you know we are powerful we're powerful we are indeed and yet we have been put to sleep by a variety of means yeah hypnosis nlp mm. MK Ultra people can talk about too, but it's far, far more sophisticated. MK Ultra died out some time ago, and all the programs that have come since then have been infinitely more um, sophisticated than that ever was. They knew at the time that they were doing it that MK Ultra fractured minds mm. and that therefore was not terribly useful because of the psychoses of the various victims that they used. And that alone tells you that they will have upped their game. Mm. and use far more subtle methods so can i just tell you something lily you know when i said we're the most powerful beings in the world i had a rose quartz crystal on my uh, wrist and it just pinged everywhere (laughs) oh really did you break it and i I didn't even touch it it's not it's not a a a rubbish uh, one either it's one from it's one from uh, thomas sabo in the uk so it's from a a proper, proper jewelers and it's just pinged all over my living room so it's oh rose quartz everywhere. It was just a bit of a strange thing that's just happened. That so I you, to you've sh- detonated your own I d- rose quartz. <laughs> I don't know. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, it was very, very uh, surreal. Well, things thing happened here. Happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally. Maybe. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna get it for you for a second, just to prove that I'm not sure. talking nonsense here. Look, can you oh see my that? Goodness. Yes, I so can. So it's just oh literally, and I didn't even touch it, and it's a very expensive bracelet as well. So. Oh, uh, fun. But yeah. Oh, I hope you find all the bits because I'm sure. Oh, you're to oh no! I'm, I'm I'm just happy that humanity have this so much power. <laughs> <laughs> How bizarre is that? I honestly? know, I know, I know. It's I, did a video, I did a video last week on black magic, and the doors were opening behind me. So, oh, 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 things oh, are very strange oh. in my reality right now. So, yeah. <laughs> well, keep grounded. Keep breathing. Keep grounded. Yeah. Tune to the heart. You've, yeah. you've got your best defences there with that. Yeah, yeah. My feet are well firmly on the ground. <laughs> and you do not need your rose quartz anymore. <laughs> no, it's obviously served its purpose. I would say perhaps it has, and it needs new threading or something else, maybe now. So, <laughs> oh God, the power. Interesting. Anyhow, interesting. Well, I hope it wasn't Mr. Anton LaVey of the Church of Satan that bust your bracelet. I don't think it was. No, it it, it felt more benevolent than that. It felt like a a message to say, you know, we're not not these dumbed-downed humans with no power. We're very powerful. You need nothing more than you Mm. Ever. Exactly, exactly. Everything is inside yourself that you need. Everything. Yeah, Yeah. and there you go. Pearls of wisdom or beads of rose quartz. (laughs) Genius. Uh, oh, anyway, so, shall we to, go back to back, these? Back to the interview. Sorry, sorry for the little diversion there, no, guys. No, but no, I like no, to, I like to, lovely. like to share about these strange anomalies that happen in life. And the well, last time we had so many when we couldn't get on the internet. We did. So we did. That's just another indication. Yeah. That we're clearly on a, on a path somewhere. Yeah, we're on the right um, path. <laughs> I'd say so. So. Uh, Church of Satan, it was set up in roughly 1966 by the uh, pretty, I think everybody on um, who, who are viewers of our show mm. um, will know who Anton LaVey is. He was born in 1930, he died in 1997, so he's no longer on the earthly plane. Um, interestingly, and I do find this interesting in terms of cult leadership and so forth, um, he was described very often as a born showman. 
Yes. And before, and before he became famous for the Church of Satan, he was doing lion taming and kind of, and I've noticed that there's this very strange correlation between a lot of the cult leaders and this circus mm. thing. There's a theme with these circuses and people who were involved in Because showy. they're performers, they're performers, they're performers, it, that's how they're doing. They're, I agree, but they're more flim-flam men and women. Mm. They are, they're, 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 the leisure de main, you know, the sleight mm. of hand. Mm. They're, they're kind of mm. magicians in a certain sense, but with a yes, small yeah. M, yeah. without the power. And yet they seem to go on to being um, a lot more magus-like. Mm. And I think LeVay would have quite liked that term. And when, when he left, um, when he died rather, the church was taken over by a chap called Peter Gilmore. There's a lot of interviews of, of, of what he's had to say. But I did find one of his quotes very interesting. He said, we believe that carnality is all that exists and the spiritual dimensions are fictional. Oh, Interesting. Okay. Now, isn't isn't it? Mm. Because I do know that a lot of people will think of the Church of Satan as, as, as a, a precursor for worshipping the devil or worshipping Lucifer or bringing forward the Dark One. And in actual fact, they're very atheistic and don't really believe in anything. I've heard. I've heard the new leader. I can't remember his name off the Gilmore. The, um, no, uh, Lucien or something. I think his name is. Is the the temple of? He's the one who uh, erected the Baphomet statue in. Oh, one you're of talking the, the temple of Set. Yeah, That's no, the it's the of temple Set. of Satan. Yeah. It's not. It's not Set. I think it's the temple of Satan. But Satan. he, okay. I watched. A, I watched. A, I watched an interview with him. It's not mm. Set. I don't think. I'll, I'll, I'll double check anyway. But anyway, I watched mm. an interview with him, and he was saying how they're atheists. They're not. They yeah, don't. They are. don't worship anything. But they're very much into. Um, the, the no God, there's no left, there's no devil. Self is God, isn't it, to them? Well, it, it kind of comes into that because no one cares. The universe is indifferent, is, is, is their, their, their major standpoint. Oh. This is an indifferent universe. And That's so interesting. The only place mm. to be is self-centered and the only way to be is in service to self. All right, apologies for that, guys. We just had a little short break there. Um, but Lily is going to continue um, on with what she was talking about with uh, Satanism and the their belief that the universe is indifferent. So I'll it is, over to that's you. right. <laughs> oh, and oh. there's We have fireworks going off, so I do apologize, but I can't stop him from barking at them. <laughs> he has a major league objection to them. So it's I don't like, blame oh, him. I don't blame I don't. him. I, I wish they would get rid of these that. noisy fireworks. So they took sets all the animals, it does, not it to really mention the upset. wild ones. Oh, I the, mean, oh, the birds and things. Oh, it's terrible. Absolutely. All of it. Mm. So, yeah, in, in different universe, well, we, in, 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 in a different universe, we would ban fireworks, would we not? Or would at least have the silent variety. Yeah, in my world, we would. <laughs> yeah, same mine too. But um, what's interesting to note about the word Satan itself in relationship to this is that it's a Hebrew word that ultimately means adversary. Now, quite why that word means adversary i don't know but it is a very interesting um kind of psychological part and parcel of their ethos because they're looking at adversarial they're taking an adversarial stance mm. ultimately mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that adversarial stance is against the natural nature of humans to be compassionate and caring and to connect with each other because what they're saying is you are your own god well in a way, we all agree with that. But we're not where we divert in our opinions is because they are very much STS of service to self. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And anything goes if it makes you happy. Yeah, and the whole reality that we're living in at the moment is service to self, service to self reality. Even even the healing and spiritual world, yeah. a lot of it's service to self. You know that it's infected with it. Yeah, it's everywhere. Mm. It is. Um, and the other the other way that they completely divert from any world religion or any sort of normal thought is that most play, most religions advocate abstinence and temperance, mm. and they do not, absolutely they do not. They say, indulge yourself in any carnal way that you wish. Mm -hmm. And that is the beast. They are mm -hmm. feeding the beast. Mm -hmm. And literally, mm -hmm. 
promulgating and promoting the bestiality of their, I don't know what to call them. What do we call them? Initiates. I'll go with initiate. Yeah, yeah. So that was mm. Levee. There's only a brief tour of Levee. I mean, obviously there's acres online that people can read should they want to follow it up about, you know, the Church of Satan. It is interesting to know one's enemy, if that is the correct term. Oh, abs- absolutely. It's very interesting to study these people. And he had a lot mm. of influence in Hollywood, didn't he? He had a lot of Hollywood yes. um, following and a lot of musicians followed him, a lot of actresses yep. followed him. And, yeah. And I, and I do think that that still is, is, is continuing to this mm. day very much with what we're seeing, the, the work that Tiffany Fitzhenry is doing. Oh, she's YouTube. doing some fantastic Fabulous work. work. Really. Really good. I, lo- I love, I don't know if you need to feel the same, Lily, but I love seeing women really step mm. into this, you know, this really yeah, fierce, too. feminine, you know, yeah. great other goddess energy. I love it. It's, it's really, uh, yeah, it really it's really is heartwarming. Lovely. Mm. It really is after years mm. of it being dominated by blokes. Mm. And good on you, chaps, because you've done fantastic oh, work. Oh, they've done sterling work, but it's nice to see that women are now coming into their own. And it they is. have They have the courage to stand up and stand up for, you know, our innocent mm. children, which is, is, is what exactly. we should all be protecting. It is, and it's good that they're finding their voices and mm. that we are all encouraging each other rather mm. than competing because there's no yeah. need for that. No, we all no add to each other's research. research. Yeah. If we're wrong, we say we're wrong. Yeah. I no, have no but investment it, yeah. in me. No, but it, nobody has all the pieces. Like I keep no, saying don't. this to people, like nobody has all the answers. Yeah. Everybody has a little piece of the, of the yeah. thing, so, and we should be working together, not against each other. If we share our pieces... If we share the little bits of the puzzle that we mm-hmm. have, we can create a, a, a much more informed yeah. and a much more intelligent mm-hmm. response to what's going on. And mm-hmm. that's why we, we are doing what we do. Mm-hmm. That's why a, a, a lot more women are stepping forward mm-hmm. and saying, actually, I've been looking at this and this is what I've found. And if we could work together and find a way of supporting each other, I think we should. And I think, I think in, in a moral term, in a moral universe, that is an obligation. Because yeah. after 2,000 years of a patriarchy that sought very much to quell the voice of woman yeah. and remove power from any femininity mm-hmm. whatsoever, mm-hmm. we do need to redress that balance. And I'm not talking about feminism here. I am talking entirely about working together with the sacred masculine and the sacred feminine in yes. harmony to bring truth and justice to the Yes! <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's needed, so let's do it. <laughs> Absolutely. We're on it. Absolutely. Next comes um, a, another chap who has fascinated me for quite a while, and I've done a lot of deep research. Yes, into this as have I. <laughs> yes, uh-huh. And this is Mr. Michael Aquino. And Michael Aquino, um, he was a very high ranking military man, um, and he left the Church of Satan under Anton LaVey over a doctrinal issue. And his issue was that he did feel that Satan existed. Whereas LeVay very clearly said, none of them do. Spirituality doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And certain spiritual entities do not exist. But Aquino very much followed the Alistair Crowley ethos that there was dark forces and one could control them. And he so will he, also he will also know that you can create them as well. He know he'll know yeah. that you can create thought form entities, and you'll if you give it enough energy. I think he did because he then set up the Temple of Set, mm. and the Temple of Set, I think roughly it was nineteen seventy five. That's the Egyptian god of the dead. Yes, and so he clearly was invoking Set in his mm. workings and rituals and magic um, circles. Um, he went to the University of California, did a keynote, and he wrote a dissertation on a neutron bomb, which is published, and people can read, should they be so inclined to, to read it. But his very specific area of research and his very specific function within the military was re- with regard to psychological warfare. Mm. Fascinating area, which at the time that he was initially in the military was pretty much in its infancy. He was seconded over to Vietnam during the Vietnam War, where they did, without question, use psychological warfare, mm. both against, I feel, their own soldiers. Oh, sorry. 
my battery again. Oh, it's always when um, we get to a good bit, Lily. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Why is that? Why is that? But he, I, I feel that they did also use it against the soldiers, hence the incredible trauma and PTSD yeah, of yeah. many of the Vietnam Viet, um, Yeah, veterans. I visited the museums there and, and they most certainly did. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's so sad. It's very, very sad. Extremely mm. sad what they did. Well, he actually felt that they failed in Vietnam. Mm. Aquino himself has gone on record saying that he felt that they failed in, in Vietnam. But he did, with his church of, of um, the Temple of Set, rather, he did believe very much in the existence of Satan and in the invocation thereof. He was then um, drafted to the Presidio Army Base in San Francisco, which is notorious for a number of reasons. I mean, an infamous base from where um, there were great many um, allegations of sexual misconduct and abuse and and Satanism, mm -hmm. obviously, um, and all of the allegations that were ever investigated by the CIA and the FBI combined found nothing. Surprise, were they all? Surprise. Were they all like this? Honestly. Um, oh, they should have said me and you in there, Lily. <laughs> <laughs> we just sorted them out, wouldn't we? Oh, yeah. oh. And then there, was repeated, there were repeated allegations that were um, in the same way that happened with the, with the Epstein affair, where people were vilified if they whistled blue or if they spoke out or mm -hmm. if they claimed that they had been um, involved in any of these scandals of child sex abuse or trafficking or anything else. And that typical, it's psychological warfare technique, mm. completely disrespect your enemy, completely um, call into question any evidence that they could possibly present and make them look mad, bad, stupid, whatever. Mm. Very easy technique to employ these days. Mm. And it was back then too. He went on to write a very fascinating book, which I've just started reading. And the book is called Mind War. People may well remember the cover, which is incredibly Masonic. The M and the W of Mind War are very, very Masonic mm -hmm. code sigils, if you like, that will have been used by the church, but are also corruptions of the um, classic, uh, what is it called, square and compass mm -hmm. that, that, that Freemason reuses. Um, his commanding officer at the time that he was, he was doing these investigations into psychological warfare was Major General Valet. Very interesting chap, actually. Another one worth a little investigate or Google or whatever search engine you use, because let's face it, they're all, part of the, they're all part of the cabal, aren't they? Yeah, they're all. But Aquino, Aquino's book was born out of what he claims is the bloodbath that is happening all over the world with physical warfare. And the book is a, an attempt to readdress that by looking at how psychological techniques could be used instead. And he actually is very interesting in what he says about MKUltra because he says it was a failed experiment and that it didn't work. Do you believe that? Or do you think that he's just saying that I'm, because... I'm coming to there. Okay. I'm coming. I'm coming right. to there. Hmm. He was sort of, I think he says that the motivation for writing this book was that the trauma and horror of war has not actually created anything other than trauma and horror. Um, I would disagree. I would say it's made millions for the right people and the, particularly the parasites in power. Yeah, of course, we have the whole military industrial complex, which, you know, mm -hmm. it was Roosevelt Eisen, that warned. Eisen, yeah, oh, Eisenhower. It, was, it was Eisenhower that warned. Oh, it's made no reason. Both, both of them did. Okay. Both of them did. Yeah, yeah. They both had something to say about military mm. industrial complex taking mm. over, both of them. And indeed Kennedy did. He said we mm. were opposed by a massive um, conspiracy beyond the realm of, of um, what we could imagine. Yeah, Where instead funny. of having armies, armies by day, he actually said this phrase, that instead of seeing armies by day, we would see like guerrillas by night. And what he meant by that was the subterfuge, the covert methods of psychological warfare. And I think that translates very well to what Aquino is talking about in his book, because he was saying that silent wars are better. The more covert it is, the better. The more it's psychological, 
to increase the, he claims, uh, the rationality, the, um, the reasonableness of human nature, as opposed to this bestial, back to the word again, human nature of creating a conflagration upon planet Earth and, and bloodbath. And so he addressed this in more as a, as a way of sort of addressing the need for psychological psyops or psychons, as he calls them, meaning psy controls, but I would say, yeah, a con indeed, uh -huh. um, to mm -hmm. actually subvert the violent tendencies, as he sees it, of the chaotic, unwashed public globally um, to control the beast within the human psyche. So an interesting full circle that we come mm. to a point where you can, I'm reading this book entirely as an academic exercise. I'm not interested mm. in the man's personal beliefs in any way. No, it's interesting form. to study these people. I, I, I do the same, you know, I, I like to study, study mm. the dark, you know, it's what all healers do. All healers study the dark. Well, we work with it all mm. day, every day. I and mean, and it is what you, you need to know it. Mm. The only way you know it is by bringing your light to it. And that's the key. Exactly. Thing. We're not, yeah, we are not diving in just for the sheer sake of it or the, the, the thrill aspect of it, because there is none. So, like, like, I'm just thinking now, so that he's telling us there that, that the psychological en energy that they can harness is worth more to them than the blood black bath that they, that they mm -hmm. can, and we, we know that, you know, war creates a mm -hmm. blood bath and that, that's, why, that's why they're doing it, because it's, exactly. it's a mass sacrifice, isn't it? Yes, so it he's, is a ritual, ritual yeah, sacrifice. Yeah. So he's saying that the, the psychological warfare is more powerful than the mass sacrifice of, of humans. And if it is, that's very kind of, what are they actually doing with our energy? It's like... Well, what, what is intriguing about this particular book is that it came out of a research paper that he wrote for the military while he was still mm -hmm. in the military before he retired. Mm -hmm. And it was used as a manual. He actually envisaged it becoming a manual for removing the need for psychological war, uh, sorry, removing the need for physical warfare, mm -hmm. which results in the bloodbath that we've talked about, but much more into the psych realm of things in the, with this idea of the psychon as he calls it yeah. let me just quickly refer to my notes because he said that MK Ultra was looking at creating mindless obedience but it was using that and the breakdown of people's personalities which resulted in psychosis and mm -hmm. you see that in the Manchurian con Candidate yeah. film yeah. where mm -hmm. it basically they become automatons I would actually argue that they became far worse than our, our automatons and, and in fact resulted in the creation quite likely of some seriously psychotic individuals who may well have been unleashed onto society. Yeah. But he's sense. talking about psychotronic warfare through the use of electromagnetic frequencies. Mm. Yeah, Tony talks now, a lot about this. Yeah, I understand quite he's a bit right. of this. Yeah. He's right, and, and, and there is a lot to do with this, and obviously people will look at 5G, but it is deeper than 5G. That's bad enough. But just watching light on a screen, a tablet, a computer, a television set, the films, wherever you are watching a light frequency, there can be something put on the back of it. The subliminals, the subconscious, as we've already said, 95% of which is awake constantly, absorbing all of that. And he was saying that in order mm. to get the, the, the cooperation and rational minds in a non-violent way, that mind war, wow. this manual he's written, is actually a non-abusive form of psychological warfare. <laughs> Boom. Boom. Oh, I have to read that I book. Know. <laughs> I know. Well, I think really we, we should do a follow-up when I've read all of this because I'm only yeah. a way into it. And it is staggering in its implications because you see if you then wed together and let's face it one spiritual ethos morals values inform everything one does in the world correct mm -hmm. i think so yeah he's coming from the temple of sect he's coming from worship and creation of egregores demons entities on a regular basis. And he's attempting to write what looks like a, 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 a 
you know, a slightly suspect manual for the military to use in psychological warfare. Where is he coming from? See, my my take on that is that could be a psyop all by itself. Everything oh, could gosh. be a psyop all by itself. Gosh. Epstein could never have existed and this be an entire psyop all by itself. We do not know. All to harvest our energy. Everything's to harvest our energy, isn't it? Yeah. It's not just about harvesting it, it's perverting it and inverting it. And programming it, re, like programming then, it from its natural state to a, from an inorganic inorga an state that the human is into some inorganic weird... Entity of form. some description, yeah. which the internet, AI, oh, wow. all of those things. So that makes me to conclude that, that kind of, and wrap it up a little. What you've got is a cult of inversion and perversion mm. if it's all a shizzle show if it's all propaganda and my mind controlled psyop murder becomes acceptable lies become truth cruelty and sexualization of children become the new normal mm. air becomes water water becomes wind everything that we think we know is being turned on its head mm. And you can and see this. You can see it happening. It's happening everywhere. Everywhere. But there's a reason for it. Now we know that there is actually something behind that. There is something guiding that. So that everything that we think just is becoming um, injustice at every turn. Mm. Every single topsy-turvy headline you read or news report you hear, it makes you go, huh? or in my case, WTF. <laughs> I say that multiple times a day. And you've got CO2, carbon dioxide, of which the world is filled and needful of, becomes the devil and is vilified. And then you have metal becoming soft and you have snowflakes becoming hard and you have good becoming bad and, and this entire inversion perversion is where we are living within the heart of the psyop that mm. actually there is a manual for which i'm currently reading and will come back and report on <laughs> wow <laughs> wow thank yeah thank you for sharing this information because um yeah i don't think people realize just the depth of deception that is in this reality and i wasn't aware of it you know i wasn't i wasn't aware that there was control opposition i thought that everybody that was in the truth movement and the spirituality circles i thought they'd just all be good people because you know I, yeah. I just i was yeah. judging everybody on, on on my own standards you know i just thought yeah. everyone was the same as me and and, mm -hmm. and they're not they're not there is no, there is serious not. spell casters out there there's serious narcissists and manipulators and that are, that are putting people down into cul-de-sacs that they can't get out of to take the power away from them. Oh, it's just yeah. a, it's a nightmare. It's, it's the inversion perversion. Yeah, yeah, it's and, everywhere. And, and, and then, you know, you come back to this thing again of how do you cope within that? Well, mm -hmm. again, that comes back to self-work and knowing yourself and your shadows, knowing what hooks you, knowing yeah. what doesn't. See, the Epstein yeah. thing hooked me big time because... Like everybody on this planet, we all went, what the hell did happen mm, there? The mm -hmm. cameras went out, the guards went to sleep, mm. he, was, he was on suicide watch, mm. and yet he's, he's had four bones in his, in, in, in his, in, in his hyoid bone, in the, in the throat, broken, and that can only be done by a, a severe force, which mm. is very hard to exert on oneself. And it hooked a lot of us in, didn't it? Because... You know, there was a lot of secrecy behind everything. And we've all gone down a variety of rat sewers to follow mm. him with his connections to high scientific minds, eugenicists and companies that set up data gathering and mm. traffic children without, without any question. And there are so many aspects to that story that are like a trail of breadcrumbs. And have mm. we unwittingly followed it? Have we un unknowingly? taken the hook and the bait I guess it's an we'll, interesting question it, it is an interesting question and it's one that perhaps we'll never even know because oh it's speculation you know we, we, we I mean and yet at the same time I came across a video that my friend Paul sent me a couple of days ago thank you Paul and it is three independent 
individual remote viewers who unknown to them were given a target number and they remote viewed Epstein's death. All three of them came to very similar, quite startling conclusions. Anyone wants to watch that? I'm sure we can pop it in the Yeah, I will do. Box. I've watched it myself and it gave me chills when I watched it. It was fascinating to me. Yeah. And I have to say, for me, that was a little piece in the puzzle that gave me mm. a picture. Mm. So if people would like to watch that, I'm not supporting the Farsight Institute because I have my doubts about them and they could equally be a psyop, let's mm. face it. Mm. In a world of shimmer, shimmering mirrors all over the place, God knows what's real. <laughs> but it's worth a little look at this particular video. It's only short, but it will blow your mind if, mm. like us, you have looked at the satanic aspects of what happened with Epstein what he was doing and how he was doing it and how karmically maybe that bit him on the ass at the end. So I'll leave yeah. that thought yeah. with you and yeah. Anastasia will pop that in the description. I will do, I will do. To watch it. And I would say that when, in it, when I don't know what you do when you're discerning information, but for me, I look at the person presenting it and I, and I think, are they, are they a good person? <laughs> like, you know, when, yeah. you, when, you watch, when you watch Tiffany, you know, you can feel that yeah. she's, you know, she's a beautiful, you know, yeah. young woman that is you know and intrigued uh, by all of it yeah yeah and yeah, and, that's, is, yeah. and that's how, and that's how I discern information I look at the person and I think are they, are they a good person and mm. you can tell you know you can look in someone's eyes and tell if they're a good person or not yeah I think it comes down to motive who's got the most to gain yeah. and why yeah I mean it's a very simple crime scene investigation thing but mm. it's nearly always the one closest to you <laughs> it's nearly yeah. always the one you first think of the first yeah. answer is usually the correct one. Yeah, it's always in your comes, face. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, that's, that's why I was particularly um, not impressed, but, but intrigued by that video that we're going to link about Epstein's mm. remote view, because it definitely ties things in a very neat parcel, which is perhaps too neat and therefore needs to be scrutinised very carefully. Yeah. But if they and have could, that power, that's quite scary, because I was thinking... The other, the other side of that video is, is that programming to believe people to believe that the dark occultists have that much power? Some of Oosh, don't give, don't give too much away. Sorry, sorry, I'm, no, spoiling, I'm, spoiling, the, I'm spoiling the plot. Spoiler. Yeah, you need to put a little time above, the, above spoiler, this video. Spoiler, I'm sorry, alert. I'm yeah, sorry, spoiler. but I just, I just have to ask you that question while I've got you with me. You know, are they? Well, are we giving too much power away to the dark? Are we giving too much power away no. to people? No, we're not. We're recognizing their strengths and their weaknesses as just as much as we need to recognize our own on an internal plane yeah, yeah. and externally but yeah. ultimately um you do you live by the sword you die by the sword oh, you live absolutely. by satanism you live by abuse you die by abuse and, and that's where i would end it because karmically there's justice in that yeah and let's face it the world is rid of um a piece of scum mm. Mm. who caused a lot of harm so let's mm. focus on that mm. the beast has died yes yeah good. he's definitely dead i feel he's dead i feel he's dead i, don't feel he's I think alive. a lot of people a lot of people uh, but, but you see again how are we ever to know no. how no. are we ever to know when there is no truth and transparency there is just a world of inversion and perversion mm. Mm. And we are being subjected to that day in, day out. So that's why we have to keep centred and grounded in what feels right to us or what does not. Because the vibration and the frequency will never lie. Yes, that's what I was trying to say. You know, when you're looking into someone's eyes and, you, and you're feeling their energy, that it carries its own frequency, doesn't it? That doesn't, it does. It doesn't lie. It doesn't lie. No, it doesn't. So that amount wraps it up. And whenever I go against my intuition, which I have done on many occasions because I have a bit of an inverted ego, um, uh, so I've yeah. not trusted my intu intuition in the past, it always comes back to bite me. So I, I would definitely agree with you have to go with what you first feel. It's, um, it nearly that belly always brain, is. That belly brain is so important. And cultivating that intuition, that gut feeling, that, that mm. entire thing is a very important thing for people to mm. cultivate in these times where what is black is white and what is inverted could pervert us from our course. Yeah. And staying true, seeking the truth, loving the light and loving our fellow humans, our fellow animals, our fellow plants, everything yeah. that lives and that's seen, even the unseen, all of those beautiful 
facets of life that make us all happy mm. and give yeah. us joy and bring us um, a connection mm. with both the world as, as it is manifest outside equally as it is within. Mm. Oh, yeah. what a beautiful place to leave it, Lily. I like that. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining me again. I always learn so much from you. And oh, thank really, you. Me too. I really appreciate you spending your Sunday um, sharing this information because I think it's really important. And thank you for supporting me as a fellow female in, in you know, standing oh. up to some of these things. And, you know, you I don't know if you know, but you've, I don't know consciously if you know, but you've kind of become a little bit of a teacher for me. And it's, it's always an honor to, um, you know, share no. the space with you. So thank you. So. Well, it's a, it, it's a great honour to be asked and it's a great honour to talk with you and to learn from you equally because, like we've said, no one has all the answers. Yeah, I don't all, profess to at no, all. we're all teachers I'm and all just students. Looking, yeah. Everybody is, yes. Yeah. And, then, and, if, and every single thing that happens is a lesson if you know how to look. So that's important. Yeah. yeah. So, Thank yeah. you for having me on again. Oh, and, thank, you know, you. thank you. Thank you to all the viewers for being interested, for commenting, for liking. Yeah. Please subscribe to Anastasia's <laughs> channel because I'm sure she'd appreciate it. I and mean, um, you know, we'll look forward to talking to you a little bit more about perhaps the the science. Yes, I would love to mm. um, to when you finish that book to do another oh. show on your findings on that book because I know it's very interesting. I've studied him a little bit myself a few yeah. years back when the whole Max Spires thing came out because I know he's yeah, very influence yes. that, that man and I've you know I've kind of peaked yeah. myself a little bit at a, a, a queen now and uh, I don't think he's yes. a nice man <laughs> and uh, well he's very clever man. He's, very he's clever clearly smooth operators all of them yeah very and they clever. use NLP techniques because oh. they know them neuro-linguistic programming for anyone who does they are them. masters in NLP they are master oh. spellcasters they're where masters to begin. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a clue. No. I wouldn't have a clue. And that's why I always say, you know, I, can't, I haven't got any power over their little weird no. spells and tricks that they do. So, No, but the greatest power ever is to be your authentic, real yeah. self. Yeah. And that in your in heart your own, as well. Your yeah. heart. Your heart. The greatest protection and shield a warrior could ever mm. have is that. It's all mm. you need. Yeah. That and good intent. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's yeah. it. That's all. Yeah. There thank we go, guys. On. There we yeah. go. <laughs> thank you all. All right. Thank you, everybody. And please, uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I'll link my email if you have any information to send us because I'm always interested in information. And uh, yeah, me too. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, post that video that she's talking about. I'm sorry for spoiling it for you. No, you didn't. I just had to say it, you know. <laughs> okay, it's okay. And um, yeah. we will see you on our next episode. So bye for now. Look forward to it. Love to everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.